let's go ahead and introduce our topic for today because I'm, I'm very excited about this, Mike, and I know you are too. Uh, Joanna Michelson, uh, she seemed to have a magical spiritual gift, uh, even from a very uh, early age, but Joanna Michelson was deceived by very dark forces when she was just a little girl. Even after she dedicated her life to the Lord, the occult had a strong grip on her soul, and her fellowship with demons brought her uh, indescribable depression and despair. And for many years, Mike, she was caught up in the occult, yet she believed that the angels who reached out to her were actually servants of God, and uh, in fact, one of them even identified himself as Jesus. And so we're mm-hmm. going to hear her story. Uh, Johanna Michelson, are you with us today? I am. Johanna, thank you so much for joining us. I uh, want to start with uh, your childhood. Uh, your fascination with the spirit world started at a very young age growing up in Mexico. Uh, can you explain about your upbringing and your family, and were you raised in a Christian household? Uh, I'd be happy to, Amy. And by the way, while I'm speaking, I'm sure you all can hear me fine, but you are a faint, if I may say, ghost of a voice oh, dear. in the background. <laughs> And I truly can barely hear you. Your volume just dropped considerably. But basically, I was born in Mexico City of an American uh, mother and father. Uh, Dad had fallen in love with Mexico in the 1940s when he was traveling through all of Latin America working for Carter Products. Decided to raise his family in Mexico. And that's where I was born. when I was six years old, my father decided to move us to Cuernavaca, which is a uh, city right across the mountains, 45 miles south of Mexico City, and that's where my sister and I were raised. When I was about 11 and a half years old, Amy, some thing moved into our home. Uh, literally, a mm-hmm. spiritual entity that clearly was malevolent, that took me completely by surprise because I had never been exposed to or involved with anything to do with spirits or ghosts or manifestations. It caught me totally flat-footed. But this thing that moved in one night when I was about 11 and a half years old uh, stormed downstairs, woke my sister up, terrified the dogs, uh, slammed doors, and the one front door that my father had locked twice with the only existing key before he left us alone for a few hours that night was standing wide open Mm. and this low mocking laugh that I heard as I stood there frozen with my gun in my hand at 11 and a half my father had left that with me for protection and I pretty much you knew how to use it but there was nothing to shoot at Mike some some invisible entity and I know Many in our audience know what I'm talking about. Um, But from that point on, I began to realize that I was developing abilities that uh, after a few years I began to understand not everybody else had or understood. This ability to look at people and know what they were thinking, to know what was going to happen before it happened, a fascination with occultism that really developed after my family and I had spent time with Bishop Jim uh, James Pike of California. This would have been when I was uh, about 14 years old, and after this thing had been in the home for about three and a half years or so. Uh, a fascination with occultism that really was uh, geared up after the son of Bishop Pike, uh, young Jim, committed suicide. And when the bishop began exploring the manifestations that that uh, suddenly started taking place, swirling all around him, that supposedly claimed to be the spirit of his dead son seeking to contact him. And uh, Bishop Pike began uh, communing with the medium, Zena Twig, and other psychics. It was at that point that I really began um, being more alert to information about the occult. Basically, I spent the next 10 years of my life with bizarre, frightening, unnerving, disturbing, mm. at some at times terrifying manifestations that I had no control over. But then when I went back to Mexico after I graduated from the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill with a uh, BFA in, in fine arts, I went back to Mexico in 1971 and became involved in a group called the Silver Mind Control Method. 
And actually, they figured out after a few years that mind control wasn't a term that really went over super well in this country. So it was changed to the Silva method, and actually, they're still in existence. They're in about 129 countries all around the world and translated in about that many languages. And basically, what they were designing uh, their program to do was to supposedly, scientifically, of course, train you to tap into the great uh, supernatural, unlimited potential of your mind and your soul, to teach you how to be a genius at all levels, how to control bad habits, how to bring instant healing and relief from pain, how to develop the genius potential. And they were going to teach us how to do this through the assistance of wise counselors who were going to come as our advisors and be in this special place of silence, which I was shocked to discover after I joined the church many years later, was exactly the same place of silence that was introduced to the to the evangelical church uh, through the inner healing techniques and the centering and the contemplative meditation techniques. We created a special place, counting down, seeing ourselves in this beautiful location, using the techniques of guided imagery visualization that have been time-honored among occultists and psychics and shamans and mystics for millennia. And into this place, I invited the one counselor I knew I loved beyond all things. I asked for Jesus to be my special counselor. And much to my astonishment, he actually came. Hello? Still yeah. here. Oh, we're, we're, we're listening. fascinated. This is oh, amazing. Good, because it feels a little bit like I'm speaking into a <laughs> No, violence. we are fascinated by your story, uh, Johanna. But, you know, um, it was at that point when this, this Jesus came in. You know, I invited Jesus as my special counselor, Mike, because I was a committed Christian. I loved Jesus more than anything else in the world. I actually, I had accepted him my freshman year in college. Uh, he was introduced to me in a personal way. I'd known of him. I grew up in a nominally Christian family. Uh, my parents were staunch Episcopalians, and I went to a Catholic uh, convent school. Marymount, talk about religious schizophrenia. I didn't quite know what I was, except I knew that there was a reality to the spiritual realm. I was certainly having face-to-face -face encounters with that, encounters that actually drove away a lot of the, the, the help and the housekeepers that we had over the years. But I also knew if there was reality to the spiritual realm and the occult, there had to be a God and a, and a Savior, somebody who could rescue me from this. I just didn't know what to do with it. So i grown up nominally Christian in, a, in an epoch, Episcopal Church that did not believe in a true relationship with Jesus. We had occultists as the key pillars of our congregation in Cuernavaca, uh, Ruth Montgomery and others. But I knew there was reality there. And when a young woman introduced me to the Lord through the Four Spiritual Laws, that wonderful little booklet that was put out by what used to be called Campus Crusade for Christ. I think yes. they've decided <laughs> Christ is a term that's offensive to some people. So they've very politically correctly eliminated it, as I understand. I'm hoping some of them will reverse this. But I prayed, and I received the Lord, and I knew on the basis of the Word of God that He was my Lord and Savior, and that I, if, if the demons dropped a, a, a counterweight from the catwalk in the next theater I stepped into, I knew I would go to be with the Lord. I had that assurance, and I carried the Word of God, I, but it never occurred to me to read it. Oddly enough, every time I tried to, it was like this, this blankness would come over my mind, but I carried it with me and I loved Jesus. Problem was, nobody taught me or told me about the things we're speaking about today, the importance of testing our experiences against the Word of God. Mike, you mentioned Isaiah 5, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. 
we are in those days now. We have been for millennia, but now on an unprecedented level. And truly, you were right when you said we need Bereans on a greater scale across the church than ever before. Because how do you know, if you do not have the solid objective source of the Word of God against which to test your experiences, how on earth are you going to know how to discern because through these people in Silva Mind Control, and I was one of their key pupils, I was a skilled psychic, they proved to us that we were operating on this special alpha dimension of mind, this special altered state of consciousness, through doing precisely the kinds of things that the so-called Edgar Casey sleeping prophet of uh, the, the 20th century did, one of the most famous psychics of all time, and certainly of the 20th century. A misnomer, he was neither asleep nor was he a prophet. He was a full trans medium who, by the way, also believed himself to be a committed Christian, read the Bible even once a year through, every year for, for like 45 years, but never understood how to apply the truth of what that Bible says. And so wound up deceiving millions of people. His association, um, research and enlightenment is... is just a stone's throw from the 700 Club, interestingly enough. But through the head of Silva Mind Control, I was introduced to this Jesus. Okay, he was doing weird things, showing up as a werewolf periodically and frightening the daylights out of me. But suddenly this wonderful being was telling me that that was just the, because I was not evolved enough. I needed to grow. I needed to develop. And as I evolved spiritually... As I learned how to truly operate at this place of silence, using these techniques of guided imagery, visualization, and meditation, which Silva Method was introducing us to, that I would be able to do unlimited, wonderful things. And the ultimate proof of that was the kind of work a little woman in Mexico City performed. Her name was Pachita. And much to my astonishment, when the Internet started taking off a few years ago, I found that Bachita was all over the Internet. And Bachita was one of the few genuine psychic surgeons in the world. Now, keep in mind, yes, there are countless frauds out there. For every genuine individual who has true psychic ability, you've got a hundred people who are manipulating and pretending and who are skilled in legere de main sleight of hand and who are very properly exposed by the amazing Randys and the other skilled magicians who, who know the techniques of deception and manipulation. I wish I could tell you they were all fraudulent, but there are some who have genuine ability. And this woman in Mexico City who had grown up in the slums of Mexico City with less than a third grade education had from the time she was a little girl with no no desire of her, her part no intent on her part suddenly found herself as a little girl going into a trance state with his being coming through and bringing the most astonishing in fact terrifying healings through her she would take a rusty hunting knife and a pair of scissors and literally cut open human bodies without the benefit of anesthesia, without the benefit of an antiseptic, in the most primitive of conditions, and would literally perform what can only be described as astonishing, miraculous operations. And I was taken to meet this woman. She'd been, um, she'd been practicing as a full trans medium and a psychic for some 40-whatever years when I met her and was subsequently uh, researched by some of the top parapsychologists and scientists in the world, including Dr. Andrija Puharic, who had a medical degree from Northwestern University with his specialty. I think it was in bioengineering and held more than 60 United States and foreign patents. And he had researched one of the top other genuine psychic surgeons in the world, a man named Adi Go, in Brazil in 1968, I believe. 
took a whole team of doctors down, and he had subsequently, after I left, been to Pachita to investigate her, as had numerous others. But when I met this woman, guys, the only thing I can tell you is the feeling in this place was so radically different from everything I'd experienced all the years that I'd been growing up terrorized by these beings. Now, through silver mind control, I was seeing a new aspect where I could gain control over these incredible forces. And then when I was taken by the head of silver mind control in Mexico City to meet Bachita, because I was a prize star pupil with great skill and ability, I walked into this place one evening, and it was crowded with people. The, the vibrations were were beyond description, a high energy level, and people who were dressed in rags, abject poverty was written all over them. Others who were who had their beautiful eighteen karat gold and diamond jewelry and and fine designer suits and and dresses on, and they'd all come to see this woman, who was reported to have astonishing power. I walked into a little altar room that I was finally taken into, and there was an altar. On the on one corner of the room, there was a little naked light bulb hanging down. It was the only light. There was on this altar an interesting array of stuff. It smelled badly in there. It smelled of, of alcohol. It smelled of blood. It smelled of dried, musty roses that were accumulated in vases all over uh, this altar that was festooned with crepe paper decorations. There was a, a picture of Jesus on the altar there was a, a crucifix with Jesus hanging on the cross there and I thought oh, this surely must be a place where the Lord is honored there were also other odd things there was a statue of an Aztec prince standing there with his spear raised high a, a prince called it uh, Cuauhtémoc who was uh, murdered by Cortes and the, and the uh, Spaniards in 1520 whatever when they came to Mexico and tried to to conquer the well they did conquer the land and murdered a lot of the Aztecs trying to figure out where the gold was hidden and this hero prince of the Aztecs Cuauhtémoc had come to Pachita saying that he was now coming to fulfill his karma coming to fulfill the work that had been unduly cut short by his untimely murder and that he was coming to do miraculous things so that he could be a benefit and a kind boon to mankind and bring healing, and so that he could evolve to a new plane of, of development and existence and be eventually incarnated as something higher than a murdered prince. Wow. When I was taken to meet Pachita, I couldn't believe my eyes, people. She was sitting on this cot, puffing on a cigarette, exhausted, a blanket wrapped around her legs, and I couldn't take my eyes off her arms. They were crusted up to her forearms in dry blood. She took my hand in hers when I met her, asked me for the first time I had ever heard the term, was I a medium? Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't know. And then she instructed me to continue my training with the Silva method and to come back that I had been selected for special work, and for the next 14 months, I became the per personal assistant to Pachita, and saw oh, and assist. I saw hundreds of operations. I personally assisted mm -hmm. in over 200 of the most truly breathtaking, astonishing miracles. The phenomena was real. Yeah, I saw brain tumors, inoperable brain tumors, removed while. This man from the American colony, whom I had brought down, who'd been given up for dead by the doctors and told he hadn't many months to live, where he, after the, the, the hermanito had arrived, after Epachita had sat down in front of this altar and we had recited the Lord's Prayer and sprinkled holy water everywhere and sung hymns and looked to the Lord Jesus to guide and direct, this man's skull as I'm standing there talking to him, holding his hands, is split open as he's lying on a, a pallet. He's telling me how weird the hands 
feel inside his skull. Yes, he can feel something odd but dull mm. inside. And suddenly, this mass stench of a tumor is pulled out. So it was was nauseating sense that came came over the room. Uh, and his eyes totally crossed. And hermanito, which is what Pachita was addressed as when when the spirit was there. This was no longer the body of Pachita. This was now hermanito, which in Spanish means little brother. Guatemoc, totally different personality, totally different voice. The eyes tightly shut. Pachita had no way of seeing what was going on, but this thing was seeing through her. I once watched him, her, thread a needle with her eyes tightly shut. And Hermanito says to me, oh, little daughter, speaking to me, look at this man's eyes. Is he all right? Keep him talking. And I looked at him, and Amy, this man's eyes had totally crossed. And I said to him, are you all right? He said, no, this feels really weird. No kidding. <laughs> and I told Hermanito, and he said, well, that won't do, will it? And he sticks his hand back inside this man's skull, fiddles around, and the eyes snap back into place. Wow. Boys, a child born dumb with his throat split open, a hairy rock materialized. No, it would not have shown up on an x-ray. This being spiritually materializing this curse and removing it, and a boy who had been dumb from birth, 16 years old, now speaking words, audible words, my father's name. Yeah, I got my family into it. I was a good little proselytizer. Oh, I bet. Mm. Yes. And here, here, I'm thinking, surely I am serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. Okay. A young man who was promised he would live died. Things that were prophesied weren't coming true. I was not a full trans medium as I was promised I would be. But I knew that this had to be from God. The phenomena was real. I was a sincere Christian. Surely God wouldn't let me be deceived. Yes. And Jesus, quote unquote, was honored. Wow. And that is sadly the frame of mind which many in the contemplative movement, in the evangelical church, in the charismatic and Pentecostal church today, that is a mindset many have tragically fallen into. Johanna, I want to make sure that our audience hears what you're saying because this is very real. Uh, folks, if you're just tuning in, Johanna Michelson is a noted author, researcher, lecturer. She's the major authority on the occult. Her, she's got an internationally best-selling autobiography. She wrote it 20 years ago. It's fascinating. It's called The Beautiful Side of Evil. And that, if you want to read some more about what she went through, you, you need to check out that book. It tells the story of her involvement in the mind control and the cult. Um, but when we come back, we're going to talk about some very uh, dire warnings that you need to hear about what is happening in the church and how it relates to what Johanna has gone through. We'll be right back. If you want to contact us about any of the topics discussed today, email your questions to comments at standupforthetruth.com. You can also call your questions in on the queue lines, 494-9010 in Green Bay or 1-800-979-9010 nationwide. Stand Up For The Truth will continue in a moment on Q90FM. If you want more info on the topics of today's show, then visit StandUpForTheTruth.com. Now, back to Mike LeMay. Our special guest this morning, Johanna Michelson, a fascinating story out of a journey out of the occult and seeing a fake Jesus. And Johanna, we need to check in and see what the Word of God says about this in Deuteronomy 18. Why don't you share that with our audience? Well, you know, if I had known what the Word of God had to say about the realm of the occult, I would not have become involved with it. And surely there is today a, an absolute famine for the Word of God, and it's the reason so many in the world today, and especially in the church, have swept into the occult. But Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 9 and following, gives us a complete overview of the realm of the occult, virtually every category here, and here is what God has to say about it. When Moses was speaking to the children of Israel before they were to enter the promised land, here is what the Lord God had to say to them. When you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, you shall not learn to imitate the detestable, actually the King James and the New King James, which I am very fond of, 
says the word abominable. You shall not learn to imitate the abominable things of those nations. Now, when God uses the term abominable, you got to know this is something he really, really, really feels strongly about and <laughs> doesn't like. In the days of the theocracy, it carried the, the penalty of capital punishment because it was viewed as high treason. What are those abominable things? Child sacrifice. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes their son or daughter pass through the fire. One of the most despicable forms of child sacrifice that was practiced in the promised land where they would take infants from newborn to four years old and lay them in the in the arms, the burning arms of the god Molach, the god Kemosh, in, the, in Carthage, the, the goddess Tanit, and would sacrifice these infants, I suggest to you today, that this abomination, while maybe not as much practiced to and offered to ancient pagan gods, is offered to a much more insidious god, the god self. And we don't call it child sacrifice. We're much more sophisticated in our postmodern age. We call it abortion. And it's not even a child. The ancients had one over on us on that. They knew they were sacrificing their precious infant, their children, we call it blob of tissue and wipe it from our life and demand the, the constitutional right to do so. But look, what else does God call abomination and contestable? Or one who practices witchcraft? The pagans today are one of the fastest growing religions, thanks to things like Harry Potter series, which I'm sure all our audience is familiar with, with the, the vampires, uh, with, with Twilight, little Hermione of the Harry Potter series. They don't care, by the way, here in the Word of God, whether you're talking white witches, black witches, or orange speckled yellow striped oh. witches. God calls it all abomination, whether you think you're cute little Hermione, the brightest witch of your age, or, or Aleister Crowley, the black magician and, and pagan. Or one who interprets omens, superstitions are in that category. How many are list clutching their crosses right now to make sure the demons don't jump at you after listening to my testimony? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's amazing how many in the audience have been known to do that, and they usually come to me very secretively to confess that later. Superstitions, interpreting omens, did a black cat cross your path? A step on a crack, you break your mother's back. Oh, oh, I broke a mirror, seven years bad luck. All of those yeah. things are in the same category as witchcraft and oh. trial sacrifice. Or one who uses divination, palm reading, astrology. How many checked their horoscopes this morning? The, the crystal ball, there are thousands of forms of seeking after the future and information. And divination, I will tell you, is practiced in the church today on an unprecedented level. We'll talk about that in a moment. Or a sorcerer comes from the Greek word phytomachia, the use of hallucinogenic drugs to put you in an altered state of consciousness, the same state reached by the shamans, the gurus, the psychics, the yogis, the occultists, so that you can cast your spell and gain power mm. in the spiritual realm or one who casts a spell. And here's the one that made me sit up and gasp when I read this as I was getting out of the occult years later, or a medium, yeah. a go-between, one who is able to commune with the realm of spirits. And I thought I was communing with Jesus, but I was acting as a medium, and so was the wonderful woman, Bachita, who was like a second mother and a mentor to me. Mm -hmm. She was a medium, God wow. as an abomination, or a spiritist, the, the Santeria, the Vudun, it covers a myriad of things, communing with it. And by the way, it also covers the Christian ghost busters <laughs> who are out there using all of these occult techniques to try to reach the demons and the spirits and the ghosts to get, help them go into the light. Yes. Oh. It's like poltergeist. <laughs> or one who calls up the dead. And that would include those like like in the new apostolic reformation church some of their key so-called prophets and apostles who think they can at the at the snap of a finger project and beam themselves up like like scotty into the third heaven where they can have tea 
in the little shack with the Apostle Paul, while Abraham drops in to tell him that, oh yes, he helped Paul write the book of Hebrews. Of course it's confusing to scholars today, the way Todd Bentley and Bob Jones do today. We've got more occultists, necromancers, shamans, witches, and sorcerers in the church today than you can stake a stick at. I, I want to find out more no about that, because, you know, something you said in the first segment really struck out to me. You said you were told uh, by spiritists that you were not evolved enough, and that sounds kind of familiar. It, it sound, you know, there are authors and, and some uh, well-known pastors who have said, you know, we need to evolve the way we pray. Talk to us about something called contemplative prayer. Now, some of the most uh, prolific speakers, authors, pastors, that they talk about these encounters with God and some amazing visions and experiences all in the realm of silence. What's really going on here? Well, what's going on is what the Lord Jesus Christ warned us about in Matthew 24 when he was talking about the signs of the end of the age. And he told us that in the end times, in the last times, right before his second coming, we would see a proliferation of spiritual deception on an unprecedented scale. And he warned us about false Christs in verse 4, false prophets, Verse 11, false Christs and false prophets, verse 24 and 25, who would come working great signs and wonders and miracles so as to deceive were it possible, and it is, even for a short while. Unique construction of the first class conditional clause in the Greek in that verse, in Matthew 24, verse 24 and 25, even the elect. And what you've been seeing since the 1960s Amy, is a sweeping in of a desire for spiritual reality. We don't want this this dogma, these teachings from a narrow-minded, bigoted church. We want to have a spiritual encounter with a spiritual reality. Never mind the church, never mind religion. We want to have an experience, and the whole move that you've seen, that we've seen, and experienced really since the mid-60s. It's been coming up. It has always been here. But we have seen a massive, unprecedented, worldwide explosion and fascination with spirituality since the 60s. And the the statistics are staggering. About 65% of adults, according to the Pew Forum on on, uh, religion that came out in, in 2009, at least 65% of adults, and that's just in this country, believe in a report having experiences with, with spiritual phenomena, belief in reincarnation, belief in yoga, belief in astrology, communion with the dead, and an experience with divinity, and that's what the contemplative movement is all about. Mm. The contemplative movement is simply taking, it's a belief system that has brought in the ancient occultic, mystical practices of the Buddhists, the mystery religions, the Hindus that have been around for millennia, and they've been brought now into the church. It started in the 2nd, 3rd century A.D., especially when Constantine, uh, a pagan king, merged, became a, quote, Christian, and merged pagan practices with Christianity. That was the birth of the Roman Catholic Church. And they opened the door to including the ancient mystical practices of the Buddhists and the Hindus and the the mystery religions to induce altered states of consciousness. They call it alpha now, and yes, you can measure, measure it with little electroencephalographs. That's what the Silva Method was doing to teach you how to go into the silence. And the fact is, all of contemplative mysticism is rooted in ancient occultism and the occult. But what's happened today, and really that's been happening since the Roman Catholic Church, the, the monastic tradition with the ancient desert fathers, began figuring out, well, wait a minute, we want genuinely, sincerely to have an experience with God. Oh! Well, we're seeing that our Zen Buddhist brethren are having this experience sitting there in their lotus position with their deep breathing techniques, chanting Om Mani Padme, Om Mani Power, Om. And if they're having an experience with, surely it must be God, because they're describing such ecstasy, such bliss, 
such transcendent mystical union with the divine, if it's working for our Zen Buddhist and Hindu brethren, Mm -hmm. then what if we take these same techniques and we'll throw the term Jesus at it? Because after all, the intent sanctifies the practice. That was the assumption in the first, second, third century, the the Middle Ages, with the the monastic brethren, the so-called desert fathers and mothers. And then in the 1960s, when we had that explosion, you guys surely, well, Amy, you may not be, Mike, I don't know how old you are, but I'm certainly old enough to remember the hippies. I was on the fringe of that movement. I was I was still too, too uh, um, aware of the influence of my father who <laughs> would have strangled me oh, hey. if I'd really been, but I was involved enough. And the whole issue there, the whole crux of that movement was a breaking away from this narrow-minded dogma. Who needs the word of God? Give me a break. Mm-hmm. Mm. Fine for the narrow-minded children of their age, like Jesus and the apostles and those dudes, but not for us. We need a direct experience. And then, in the Roman Catholic Church, in the in, at, to Father Thomas Keating, who was the abbot of St. Joseph's Abbey in, in Massachusetts, central Massachusetts, at the Quabong Valley, he had long been having, as a Trappist monk, Uh, experiences with meditation. You know, they brought in all of these meditative techniques out of Zen Buddhism that had been Roman Catholicized for 1,500 years. Mm -hmm. And then he was looking around and he was seeing that all the little Roman Catholic kids, the young people, the, the adults, were yearning for experience, and they were moving into Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. Thank you, Beatles. Mm-hmm. They were moving into LSD and hashish and and all of these hallucinogenic experience, mind-blowing, altered state of consciousness-inducing drugs and meditations that were giving the kids an experience. And he sat around after he'd invited a great Zen master, who, by the way, He's 101 or two now and still alive. Uh, Rashi Sazaki, the great Zen master, he invited him to lead a Buddhist retreat at their abbey. And they decided, you know, there's got to be something like this for lay people. So he sent off his trappist brother, William Menninger, to look around. And then finally in 1974, they spent a lot of years scouting their, their scrolls down there. They find a musty old copy of a 14th century guide to contemplative meditation because the Middle Ages you had a lot of the mystics, St. John of the Cross, Teresa de Avila saints who surely must be from God because look at the manifestations they had they were levitating, they were shaking uncontrollably they were speaking in other tongues they were having mystical Mm. ecstatic experiences, Mm -hmm. surely these techniques were opening them to God and then he developed what today is known as centering prayer, yes. the whole centering contemplative movement, and it exploded literally even into the evangelical church. Hey, Johanna, I, now, I, I, Johanna, I'm sorry, I've got to interrupt you. I'm against a hard, hard break, but uh, trust me, I'm old enough to remember that stuff. Hey, when we come back with Johanna Michelson, we're going to talk about how this whole thing about youth being spiritual but not religious is infecting and destroying our youth. If you want to contact us about any of the topics discussed today, email your questions to comments at StandUpWithTheTruth.com. You can also call your questions in on the queue lines, 494-9010 in Green Bay or 1-800-979-9010 nationwide. Stand Up For The Truth will continue in a moment on Q90FM. This is Stand Up For The Truth. Call in your questions now at 494-9010 in Green Bay or 1-800-979-9010 nationwide. Now back to Mike LeMay. Our special guest this morning, someone who has lived through the occult and the Lord, the true Lord Jesus Christ, delivered to her, Johanna Michelson. Johanna, we work with a lot of youth here at Q90FM, and I am repeatedly hearing youth say, I am spiritual but not religious. And isn't this just really cold words they're being fed that doctrine has become meaningless? Well, you know, that's exactly right, and it's heartbreaking to listen to, but I understand where the young people are coming from. A lot of adults feel the same way, and that has been 
the whole crux and foundation of what is called now the emerging church. They have been a, a horrendously powerful influence in separating people, and the young people especially, from any kind of adherence to the Word of God, because that's what's viewed as the nasty, dusty old logo. We want a new rhema, a new experience, a new revelation. And that's the foundation of the entire emerging church. So you've got a, a myriad of people who have infiltrated and influenced the, even the evangelical church, which is no longer really even evangelical, saying, look, we need to reinvent Christianity for a new generation. We have to be relevant to the young people, this postmodern generation that's no longer tied to the, the, the word of God, because that's oh doctrine. But look, listen, if you do not have sound doctrine, if you do not hold to the inerrant word of God, how do you come to understand what the word of God has to say to us for today? That the Lord Jesus himself warned us about what we would see in the end of the age. Tremendous spirituality, a desire to be spiritual, divorced from what we now call dogma, doctrine, the church. And tragically, I understand what happened there, because what happened was you had a lot of so-called pastors who themselves began to question and doubt the Word of God. They began to listen to the voice mm -hmm. of the serpent in Genesis 3. Indeed, has God said, and they bought the lie that truly we shall not die. There is no narrow-minded Bible-thumping God who has the temerity to say, Thou shalt and thou shalt not. There is no hell. There is no exclusivist perspective of the scriptures. Indeed, has God said, surely not. God is a she. God is a it. God is a mystical force, the force of Star Wars we can all be a part of. And then the bottom crux of all occultism, that lie that the serpent said to Eve, indeed, has God said, you surely shall not die, for in the day you disobey God, which is what eating the fruit was all about. God knows, this wicked God who's holding out on you, that your eyes will be opened, and you shall be as God, having knowledge and power. And that is what's being used to reach out to the young people today. Millions of them being drawn in through the experience. The, the pagan federation, the, the, a, a pagan organization in Great Britain, they were overwhelmed with joy and excitement as far back as the year 2000 because hundreds of young people children even age 10 were saying I don't want to be part of my mom and dad's church anymore I want to go to Hogwarts school of witchcraft and wizardry so I can be a good little wizard like Harry Potter mm -hmm. and a good little witch like Hermione who have these great powers and abilities who, who are special mm -hmm. and what has happened is we have seen the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 4, where he says the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times many will fall away from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, where in 2 Timothy chapter 4 we see that people have fallen away from the faith and have gathered teachers who will tickle their ears and tell them what they want to hear. Oh, you don't want dogma? Say the leaders and the so-called pastors of the emerging churches, where they do not have messages from the Word of God. They have conversations mm -hmm. where they all sit around in their flip-flops and their mocha frappuccino mixes from Starbucks, sitting there pulling their collective ignorance on how they feel about a subject. Look, mm -hmm. experiences and feelings are manipulated so easily. That is the whole point of my sorry story and the only reason I wrote The Beautiful Side of Evil. People wake up. The Word of God, yes, I know. That makes many cringe as they even hear me using it in that context. The Word of God tells us and warns us. Look, the Holy Spirit didn't croak at the end of the first century. The gifts the genuine gifts of the Holy Spirit spoken about all through the book of Acts 
and Ephesians and First uh, Chronicles chapter 12 and 14 and Romans, many other places. These gifts are operative today. Yes. The gift even of miracles and tongues and signs and wonders and true prophecy, which is not in the New Testament always foretelling the future. But what has happened today is because we have stepped back from holding on to what the Word of God tells us and what the Word of God directs, we have stepped back and gone with what feels right. And so our theology has been switched and twisted. We have gotten away from the adherence to the Word of God. Boy, the attack on the Word of God is relentless. Yes. You ever wonder why? Why do you have so many people, if, if the atheists are right and the Word of God is irrelevant and God isn't there at all, you ever wonder why they spend such an inordinate amount of time and energy and money making sure that the Supreme Court of this country bans and abolishes it? Yes. And gets all of the Gideon Bibles out and, and why it's okay to give taxpayer money to artists who feel perfectly free to put the crucifix and the cross of the living God, the, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, into a vat of urine? Why is there such an undermining of the Word of God? People, you don't need to look any further than Genesis chapter 3. Thank Johanna, you, thank Johanna, you. thank you. We, we are up against another heartbreak, but we want to thank you for joining us. Uh, God bless you for your courage, and we look forward to talking to you again very, very soon. Johanna Michelson. Yes, and, and if you want thank a you. great video, there's, there's one of Johanna on there in the trailer for Why Does the Gate 2. Uh, it's on our website today at StandUpForTheTruth.com. And, and Johanna, thank you. You have blessed our audience, and we definitely want to have you back. I would love to. It's been a joy to be on with you. Thank you too, Mike. God bless you, my friend.